opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Stop there for a minute. So, as I was kind of praying through this and saying, okay, God, explain to me what, what this is meaning. All right, Philadelphia would be the doorway to this area. And the very first thing that he says is, what God opens, nobody can close, and what he closes, nobody can open. And as I started to pray through this, how many times in our language have we said in our prayer life, well, if there's an open door, I'm going to walk through it. And as long as the door remains open, guess what? I'm going to continue to take these steps. At every area of ministry that I've ever been in, I've been, this is my third church that I've been in. I was a youth pastor in Bryan. I was a children's pastor in Lansing, and now obviously a senior pastor here. And everybody always says, Ben, and I had a conversation this week with a group of pastors, and they said, Ben, how long are you going to be in Elwood? I said, I have no idea. And they said, why? I said, as long as the door is open, I'm going to be here. So, could it be one more year? Sure. Could it be 30 more years? Sure. Because that's my commitment to the Lord. My commitment is not to the local church as much as it is, is to God. Do you notice that? He's going to be the one that I'm going to answer to at the end of my life. And so as long as the door is open here, I'll stay here. The same thing happens every instance of our lives. I have so many people have asked me that question. Ben, when I pray for something, how do I know if there's, if there's two areas, right? And one feels like it's an open door, then walk through it. It's an open door. But I feel like there's this door that's closed. Should I just bang through it? Probably not. Because what does it say? When God, when God opens doors, he opens doors that no one can shut. And he shuts doors that nobody can open. Here's another simple question. Pastor Ben, what do I do when I'm standing and it feels like both paths are open? I pray and both doors feel like it's open. Then go to the one that you want more. Really? You mean I'm allowed to do that? Yes? God is for you, right? He wants you to, like, enjoy life. That's the reason he created the bicycle and sunshiny days in the middle of October, the end of October, right? There's a reason there's butter pecan ice cream. There's a reason there's Indianapolis Colts football. And it shows you that there's an evil one because they played the Patriots last week. I don't know why I have <laughs> but literally what this is talking about when you go back and you look at the connection to the Old Testament it, there's a passage in Isaiah it's Isaiah 37 it's kind of an obscure chapter there, there's, a, there's a person whose name is Shebna, now there's not a test at the end of your life about these names but Shebna was the keeper of the temple so whoever was the keeper of the temple had the keys to the Tomorrow. If you have the keys to the temple, guess what? You chose what time, what time the doors closed, and you chose what time the doors opened. Yeah. Now, Shebna was not a godly person, but God says to Isaiah, go and give this prophecy that after Shebna is a person by the name of Eliakim. Shebna was, a, was not godly, that's the reason why he lost his job, Eliakim was. And here's what it says in Isaiah. Eliakim will shut the door that nobody can open. Why? Because he has a key. He locked it. He's on the inside. So you can be on the outside and you can bang and bang and bang and bang and bang and guess what? Until Eliakim decides I'm going to open the key, unlock it, open the door, nobody's going to get in. So you go from Isaiah 37 to Revelation chapter 3 to the church of Philadelphia. Now he's saying it's no longer about a physical person. You see that? When Jesus died, and this is now going to be a connection back to what happened during the time. There was, there was, there was a question, I think it was from Bill Hunt, who asked the question, when Jesus was dead in three days, what did he do during the three days? Right? You could draw the connection, and at some point we could sit down and have this conversation. During his time, it said that he went to, through death and all the that he went to, to Satan and took the keys. The key of David. Right? And so now it's no longer a physical temple because this is now the connection when Jesus died on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn from top to bottom. It separated the Holy of Holies, the most holy place, 
where the Spirit of God was housed. Now that the veil was torn, it was symbolism that now everybody had access to the Spirit of God, which is known as the Holy Spirit. So it means each and every one of us, if you prayed and asked Jesus to come into your life, you actually didn't do that. But, well, I, I, I thought I did. Yes, I did. No, because Jesus is a literal, physical human being. He is in heaven. He's coming a second time in a physical presence. He was physically raised from the dead. So when we pray, who we're actually asking come into our hearts and minds and change and transform us is the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that was housed in the Holy of Holies. So what's the connection? He says that Jesus holds the key of David. And when Jesus comes along and he opens the door, the door is the door of salvation. And when he opens the door, guess what? You're saved. You see, because a lot of people, I talk to a lot of people who have a warped theology. Theology is an understanding of God. I talk to so many people, and this is a lot of the theology that they have when it comes to God. Well, I hope I'm saved. Hope. What do you mean you hope you're saved? Well, I do a little good because I know I also do a little bad. And I'm hoping at the end of my life that I do a little more good and a little more bad. So you're like, wait, wait, do you think this is how it's going to play out at the end of your life? That God's going to bring you forward and we're going to set little pebbles on a stone. Okay, you did one good thing and you did a really bad thing. Oh, but then you helped a little old lady cross the street with the groceries, so there's a really good thing. Oh, <laughs> But then you were fighting with your brother and you said some unkind things, right? And I saw when you uh, kind of gave the white ring and the people cut you off the other day. I saw that's a, that's a big number. And do we stand back and we really think, I, I've talked to people that they really think, I hope at the end of my life, the scale balances, I did more good than bad, and that God may say, hey, go ahead and come on in. Really? Because what I read in the Bible, my understanding of the way that it works with Jesus, and we talked about this in Sunday school this morning, in the book of John, it says that Jesus, the Father, will not lose anyone. The Father will not lose anyone who will pray the prayer of salvation. When he opens the door, guess what? No one's going to close it. And we like that. But do you hear what it says after that? But when he closes that door, <coughs> no one can open it. I know a lot of people also have bad theology when it comes to Jesus. Because we really think that Jesus is kind of that pursuant boyfriend that really is below our standards and so we can play hard to get. And so we think that Jesus is going to continue chasing after us and be like, oh, come on, please. That guy was that boyfriend, right? And it was only because Amanda knew that she was going to have to get a restraining order for the rest of her life. That's the only thing that she had to <laughs> But I know what it is to be that pursuant boyfriend. Please, please, come on, please. And we have this idea of that's who God is. That at any point we can go, sure, okay, no, we can go steady at this point. What it says is that he's, he's not playing. That when he closes that door, if you reject him enough, this is it's going to be some new theology for some of you. That he loves us enough that if you reject him, he's going to say, okay. He loves us enough to, to walk away. What? That's the reason why I tell people we have to be careful. Because God's going to call us. And he, he longs, he wishes that no one will perish. No, no one. But if you say, you know what? I, 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 I love my sinfulness. As a dog eats his vomit, so a fool in his folly. If you want to eat your vomit, if you want to live in sin, sorry I didn't mean to make you sick, it's in Proverbs, you can look it up. <laughs> then he'll walk away from us. It's actually encouragement for the church of Philadelphia. Because when I started reading to the church of Philadelphia, okay, what's the encouragement? And here's the encouragement. Though you may be small in number, remain faithful. He says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. 
I will make those who are synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, they are liars. I will come to them, and they will fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. What I've, what I've noticed in verse 8, what I've noticed in verse 9, there are some really cool connections that are going on in verse 10. I know your deeds. I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know you have little strength and you have kept my word and you have not denied my name. What does that mean? That means there's a culture who's not very godly. Amen? One person believes that. Anybody else? Yes. Amen, right? This is written 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, he says, culture's not very godly. So we think it's bad today. It's been bad for 2,000 years and before that. Go read about Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? It's, it's, there's nothing new under the sun. And though we may be few in numbers, right? Remain true. Remain steadfast. Yeah. What I love is when they took the words of God to a, another country who, who the words of God had not yet been translated into this, com to this country. They couldn't come up with a word for being steadfast. To, to remain true. <clears throat> and so they started thinking through. So part of what they do is they, they get in with the natives. They start to, to learn their language. And they still couldn't. They didn't have a word for steadfast. And so finally they said, okay, this is how they translate it. So this was a, a, a developing country, a third world country. That everything, that how they transported, how they moved, was on the back of a donkey. And, they, and if you've ever worked with, an, with, a, with a donkey, it's a pretty stubborn animal, Right? And so, at least I've been told I never worked with a donkey, so I'm taking somebody's word for it. And so, if, but you've worked with a donkey, sometimes it has a mind of its own and it wants to do its own thing, right? And you start pulling it, and guess what? It pulls back, right? And you say, we want to go this way, and the donkey says, no, I, I'm not going to be moved. And so how they translated the word steadfastness is like that donkey is rooted, and the more you pull and the more you push, it's not going to move. That's how we're supposed to be. So there's a great word picture. When it means to remain true, it means, you know what? I'm going to grow some roots. And you may push me, you may pull me, but I will not be moved. Remain true to the word of God. The church of Philadelphia, this has happened to. You may be small in number. I know you have a little strength, and you're probably thinking, you know what? Forget about it. It feels like the enemy is winning. Maybe I should just the church of Philadelphia. I see you. I know you. Remain true. If you will, I'll use a little liberty. Because I think we can take the biblical principles from 2,000 years ago and apply them today. Is that okay? To the church in Elwood, Indiana. You may be few in number. I know your strength may be about to give out. But I see you. Know your deeds. I've opened the door. No one's going to shut it. Continue on. You have kept my word. You have not denied my name. I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they're not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Stop there for a minute. Because what I love about this is, 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 is this, this juxtaposition. Right? Because right now, those who are small, those who are few, have a little strength, right? They're, they're the ones that are kind of getting walked on. And there's this, there's this worldly people, right? This, these are the holy people. These are people who are following long and hard after God. There's, there's, there's a lot of people who have strength. There are a lot of people who are wealthy and they have fame and they're prestigious, right? And so you look at them and you go, well, maybe I should switch sides because I feel like, I feel like they have everything and we have nothing. Listen, this is the revelation. When I come, whoop, it's going to be flipped. Just don't 